Today our cane growers virtual bus tour visits Cairns, the tropical gateway to Australia's Great Barrier Reef and a hub for exporting Queensland raw sugar to the world. As international tourists venture out to snorkel and dive on the coral caves and ribbon reefs, we're venturing upstream from the port on Trinity Inlet to see what cane growers are doing to give the World Heritage listed reef a helping hand. This is the Mulgrave Milling District, where in excess of one million tonnes of sugarcane is harvested each year. That equates to about 160,000 tonnes of raw sugar destined for export. Farmers here introduced green cane harvesting and trash blanketing in the 1980s and they're continuing to lead the way with industry best practice in environmental management. Our guide for the day is Paul Gregory, a second generation cane grower who farms on nearly 250 hectares at Packers Camp, right on the edge of Trinity Inlet's sensitive wetlands. It's a spectacular part of the country. We're pretty much in the geographical centre of the of the, uh, the valley that runs back between Cairns and Gordonvale here and surrounded by beautiful mountains and, and pretty stunning landscape and I guess what we try to do is, is farm in that landscape. Utilise the landscape both for enjoyment and also for opportunities for the farming, for the farming side of it. The farming in a landscape is, is a, a phrase that uh, one of my friends has coined that um, farm in, in a landscape instead of in spite of it. It's making the most of, of what your property provides you with. A reef guardian farmer who's spent years working with the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority to promote best practice in farming, Paul understands the strong community expectations behind protecting the region's world heritage assets. He's doing his best to ensure water leaving the farm is clean, free from nutrients, chemicals and sediment that could damage the sensitive marine ecosystem. This is probably right at the very margin of where you can grow sugarcane. Uh, we're at the end of a catchment. This catchment on my property starts from a freshwater stream right through to uh, a full mangrove salt pan. The whole method of farming that I employ here is to try to keep the water as long as I can on my property before discharging into the uh, Tamaki's Creek behind me here. The way I can do that is use a natural geography and I direct my drains, I direct my drills, I grasp my headlands so that the water flow eventually makes its way to one of these natural almost like a sediment trap or a nutrient trap. And in this instance here, there's probably about four hectares of untouched rainforest that's been here forever. Bit of cyclone damage recently, but uh, never been milled, never been, uh, never been logged. So it's like a natural filter for the water that leaves my property before it gets into this tidal creek behind me here. In a region of high rainfall, catching nutrients and sediment before they leave the farm hinges on one crucial element, maintaining riparian vegetation. Early European farming practices in Queensland saw large areas of vegetation on creek banks cleared, but the Gregory family farm, where riparian vegetation is well maintained, is a textbook example of smart environmental management. Riparian vegetation is very, very important. It performs a couple of uses. It actually traps sediment before it runs into the, um, into the runner stream, and attached to that sediment is usually the nutrients and the, um, the vegetation holds the sediment and then uses the nutrient. In Queensland's wet tropics, where waterlogging of soil is the biggest issue impacting on productivity, it's all about working with the geography, getting the drainage right and ensuring costly inputs like nutrients are taken up by the plants. Laser levelling of blocks is ensuring drills are gently sloping and water runs off at low velocity to where it needs to go. Mother Nature then chips in with wetland systems, filtering runoff to minimise any impact on the neighbouring marine ecosystem. So pretty much what we've got here is a dis discharge point from this, this third of the, this paddock, where the water actually comes down these drills on these interspaces, and uh, we'll meet with some water out of this short catch drain here, and it discharges into this natural wetland here, which is uh, a Malaluka a forest, probably 150 metres through to the stream. This area is pretty much as I remember it when I was a boy, which is a, a fair while ago. Any sedimentation that would have occurred in this area, any deposits that, uh, from sediment that's left the property, would have settled out in this area because the grades through here in this wetland are very minimal. Water's had a chance to sit here. This is a swamp in, in the wet season. This water sits in here. 
um, drain slowly out through here, through the uh, remains of this Melaleuca forest before it actually gets into the mangrove salt pans closer over towards the river. Just another opportunity to, uh, to clean up the water, strip any nutrients out. Very healthy little ecosystem here and actually quite a useful part of our whole farming operation. Closer to the inlet, Paul shows us Alley's Landing. Once a makeshift port for the tin industry predating the city of Cairns, nowadays it's a thriving estuarine ecosystem with abundant marine life. Mangrove salt pans fanning out from the edge of the estuary to the sugarcane headlands are helping filter sediment and nutrient. Nature's way. Well, this area here is a pretty representative of the other sort of wetland we've got on the property, which is obviously mangrove salt pan. Um, still heavily vegetated with different sorts of rainforest trees and that because we are in a transitional period or a transitional stage of the creek between uh, pure tidal salt and freshwater. So you've got species like this uh, large acacia cedar here and we go across the, uh, you can see the buttress roots on some of these or these little knobbly spiky roots here from some of these uh, mangrove varieties here. And this, this mangrove flat extends for about three to four hundred metres in here before it gets to the creek proper where we see those mangrove trees that we all, we all know too well with the big flying roots and things like that. So we've got a, a large flat surface here that acts as a buffer between the cane there and uh, the river. If the rows at this end of the farm appear perfectly straight and contoured, it's no accident of nature. In a capital intensive undertaking that's going to take several years, the farm is being converted to a GPS mapped controlled traffic farming system. Row spacings and wheel track sizes are being matched. It means when farm machinery is working the rows under GPS guidance, the risk of compacting the plant zone and damaging the crop is minimised. Another key benefit is that the grower can apply best practice in zonal tillage, minimising sediment loss by only cultivating the plant zone at the end of each growing cycle. It also creates a firmer inter-row spacing, better for machinery movements. This year we've been given the opportunity to um, move to a controlled traffic farming system. We always planted in the last 10 or 15 years, we've planted at uh, 1.52 metres and then out to 1.624 metres. Um, this year we've started a, a program where we're going to convert the whole farm to 1.85 metres, uh, GPS controlled. And this paddock of plant uh, 208 that you see here uh, about, at about um, 12 weeks of age, this was firstly laser level, the whole, the whole 50 acres here was mapped and then uh, designed to work with the geography as, as well as we could and then lasered to that, planted. Uh, since then, it's obviously just been planted and sprayed um, and it's at the point where I'll probably um, run my fertiliser into the drill and um, put a little bit of dirt down around it, close the drills up and form the beds with uh, GPS controlled tractors. And then next year we'll plant, uh, harvest it with the GPS controlled harvester and bin tractors and hopefully we'll end up with a uh, nice firm traffic ways and um, nice soft growing zones. Across the road the same process is just beginning on another section of the farm. Here Paul is running an offset disc plough to break up the soil in preparation for laser levelling. Once the block is contoured, GPS mapped and planted, there will be next to zero disturbance of the soil from one growing cycle to the next. It's a great outcome not only for the environment, but also in productivity terms, given the benefits GPS offers in day-to-day -day farm management. And one of the reasons that convinced me to go to this is not just about the, the control of sediment running off the paddocks, it's uh, more specific placement of nutrients and um, an ability to use soil ameliorants that uh, are delivered directly to the growing zone. So really it's about profitability, productivity and an eye to the future. It's a future that hinges on cane growers embracing a best management practice approach to farming and they're achieving that via Smart Cane BMP, a voluntary, industry-driven best practice accreditation scheme. Smart Cane BMP looks at all areas of the farming operation to boost productivity and profitability 
while ensuring farm management practices are in step with community expectations. Smart Game BMP is a tool that we can use and um, it's a clearly defined set of practices that is recognised by government, who are the regulators in this area, to be uh, contributing to, to water quality health. Now, some of the works around uh, acqu acquiring your accreditation are quite onerous. Um, the recording of actions and activities on the farm is not something that was done in past by growers. It's a, a problem that we face at this moment, the actual documentation of what we're doing. It's a step that I guess as a farming community we'll have to take. The seven module accreditation system includes three core modules. They're in soil health and plant nutrition management, irrigation and drainage management and weed, pest and disease management. Their practices Paul Gregory believes the majority of growers are already undertaking. However, he cautions it will take time for the Smart Cane BMP industry benchmarks to be achieved across the industry and it's up to growers to seize the initiative. As a retired, long-standing divisional councillor, Paul is well aware of community sentiments on environmental management in Queensland's wet tropics. At the same time, there are the commercial realities facing farmers in an industry where margins can be tight. It's why initiatives like the Australian Government Reef Program that partners with growers in projects to improve water quality are so important. have got to understand that uh, there is a, obviously a very serious commercial side to this. We're uh, not in it to, to lose money and you've got to be financially sustainable to be environmentally sustainable. I mean, if, if you didn't have a few spare dollars, you couldn't invest it back into the farm and, and make sure that the best practices are followed. Always remember that we are farming, but always in the back of your mind have the fact that you are custodian of the land as well. Like everything in farming, best management practice is all about achieving a balance between farming productively and profitably on one hand, and on the other, meeting community expectations as custodians of the land. It's a role Paul Gregory and his fellow growers in the Mulgrave district are taking seriously as they adjust their farm management practices to deliver better environmental outcomes. Outcomes that will ultimately help protect the delicate marine ecosystem that's just on their doorstep. To all of us who own land and, and maintain a living from, from the land, there's no place like your own and it's the most important thing in your life. But there's another 23 million Australians out there. They have an emotional attachment with many things. They, you know, they all feel that Australians own the Daintree and Australians own the Great Barrier Reef and, and that may be the case and, and both world icons. The awareness of being a part of the maintaining of, that, of the standard around those, those icons is something that you develop and weighs heavily on you as a landholder and um, there are expectations from the other people in Australia about what you do with uh, what they perceive as theirs or what they have an emotional attachment with.